a uh, bit of an introduction. Um, my name is Jeff Casby and I'm the Livestock Development Officer based with New South Wales DPI. And, and um, I'm chairing this session. First, I'd just like to thank uh, Sheep Connect New South Wales and Animal Health Australia who are sponsoring this session. A little bit of housekeeping. This is a concurrent session and we've got the beef session happening as well. Uh, participants can move between the two sessions by going up to the top right hand corner of your screen. There's three dots above more and you select there and it'll take you out of this webinar and take you back to the landing page. And from there, you navigate to the beef section and then back again to the sheep if that's what you want to do. Alternatively, at the end of this session, you'll navigate there to the, the final session. Okay, we've got eight wonderful speakers today and uh, it's a very tight schedule. They've got, we've got seven minutes allocated to each session and um, it's very difficult in seven minutes to give a detailed rundown of the research. So I encourage everyone to go to their proceedings, page 26, the livestock information starts for more detailed information. I'd just like to uh, introduce to you now our first speaker and that's uh, Dr. Jane Kelly, a lecturer in livestock production management from Charles Sturt University. She has experience and is currently focusing on extensive livestock industries and she has particular interest in livestock breeding, grazing systems and animal welfare. Thanks Jane. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Yes, uh, today my project, uh, my research is looking at barley grass seed contamination in sheep. Uh, some work I did some, from my PhD. So essentially, grass seed is an issue where the grass, the seeds of certain grasses, uh, penetrate the the flesh or um, the eyes, the facial organs, the skin, um, and into the carcass of grazing sheep. It's a huge problem and causes significant issues for live animals, including wool contamination, um, skin and tissue damage, facial damage, organ damage, considerable abscess inflammation and pain in the animal, and we get considerable live weight loss and mortalities as well, particularly in weaner, weaner animals. There's a number of impacts on processing, including uh, the cost due to labor and slowed processing, carcass and skin wastage and devaluation and significant discounts in price and potential loss of export license for the plant. The main issue, uh, main perpetrators of the problem are a number of grass species and there are seven in total and you can see them there on the screen but the main one that I focused on was barley grass and as it's associated most with the literature. Barley grass is also listed in the top 20 residual weeds of crops and due to a number of changes in climate farming practices, the, the plants are adapting, leading to spreading populations and so potential future increases in seed contamination. The question was asked whether we can control those weed populations, which would actually lead to livestock productivity gains, given that integrated weed management have been most effective in controlling barley grass if it's correctly timed. Essentially, we developed a, a big model um, which simulated this process, looking at the growth of barley grass plants and their connection to the live, into a livestock submodel. Uh, and then we looked at the cost uh, at the end once we put some um, barley grass management strategies and simulated those within the model. The scenario looked at a barley grass infested lucerne pasture over 10 years uh, between 1990 and 2017 using climate and pasture growth from Wagga and seed density thresholds or weed, seed, weed density thresholds from between five and a thousand plants per metre squared which triggered those control mechanisms. Crossbred weaner sheep were simulated on the pasture and the stocking rate of 10 was um, 10 DSEs was con made constant. Essentially we used a number of treatments with two herbicides, an early and a late, simulating early herbicide treatment and uh, something to prevent seed set and a repeated mowing and then combinations of each of those. And we simulated that in the model and basically showed us that the, the smaller the population of barley grass at the start, when you implement those weed control strategies, you do get a, a return. If you do nothing, then you're getting um, significant losses. So any barley, no barley grass control led to a significant economic loss over 10 years and that would be exacerbated by current lamb, con, lamb market conditions. The highest return we got was looking at a, a late herbicide and a repeated mowing in the same year when applied at the lowest density population. 
Best overall gains were due to integrated weed management strategies as opposed to singular weed management strategies and when they were applied to very low density populations. And repeated mowing, time, timely applied when um, in the sheep production system, were quite effective in reducing seed production, uh, in the, particularly in the low density populations. And this leads to some take home messages. There is a value in, in using integrated weed management to control barley grass um, in land production systems, particularly in low weed densities. And even though barley grass provides us with good early feed in the season, there's a significant loss later on once there is um, due to carcass seed contamination, and that has implications for animal welfare. So control applications need to be applied in a timely fashion uh, in, for best practice um, for early results. Um, so early herbicides applied correctly and late herbicides correctly and a repeated mowing applied at post inflorescence emergence um, will lead to best results. And potentially there's, there's potential to, to use mixed methods across years, so potentially using um, repeated mowing in some years and then followed by integrated methods later in the year can lead to, to best results, um, in, particularly in, in lamb systems. But the best um, option would be to maintain a competitive pasture. Obviously, with most weeds, that's the case. Favour drought tolerant species, but we haven't yet trialled that in the model. So that would be the next stage. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, that's the end of my quick snapshot. Oh, thanks, Jane. That was uh, a very, very quick rundown. Now we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone would just like to pop a couple of questions in the Q and A area, and that way means everyone can have a bit of a look at those. But just to start off with, uh, Jane, how important is it to sort of act early uh, when you you start? Let's say you've put a lot of effort into putting an improved pasture in place. Um, how important is it to start sort of it, acting? It, yeah, it's super, super important. The problem with barley grass is that we find that um, people see it as feed um, earlier in the season. Um, it looks good. Um, and the, the research shows that it's high energy, high protein feed. Uh, the problem is later in the season, once it puts that seed head up. So when you establish a new pasture and you're putting in um, and you, you see those few plants, best to get onto that early um, and make sure that, that that new pasture is well established to, to create competition because one barley grass plant can put out um, hundreds of seeds. And so you have a small population, you've got hundreds and, and potentially thousands of seeds that will then contribute to the population in the next year. And if we get a seasonal issue, a dry period, um, it'll just take on um, really quickly. So yeah, that's the key message, I think, getting onto it early. Thanks, Jane. Look, I think what we might do now is uh, if people can, if they have questions, put them in the Q&A. We're just sort of tight for time. So I'll, I'll um, now just like to introduce to you uh, Bruce Allworth. Everyone in this region would would, would know Bruce. Bruce, he's a well-respected uh, lecturer, professor and farmer across the region. Uh, Bruce is a professor of livestock systems and director of at the Fred Morley Centre at Charles Sturt University School of Agriculture, Environmental and Veterinary Sciences. Bruce operates his own sheep and cattle property in southern New South Wales. Welcome, Bruce. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, and welcome to everyone, I'm going to just give you a quick snapshot uh, of on the uh, Australian Sheep Sustainability Framework, which was uh, launched in April this year. And I'm going to do that. Um, so it's a sustainability framework and it's about uh, giving the credentials uh, for the sheep industry around four main themes of sustainability. And I'll go through those themes, but essentially they're around uh, our, how we treat our animals, how we treat our environment, how we look after our people and what our contribution is to our, our community. And of course, uh, how economically uh, sustainable the industry is. So in terms of what a sustainability framework is, and there are now a number around, um, it is a reporting of sustainability practices. Um, and for uh, animal industries, it's broader than just the environment, as I've indicated, and certainly our animals are very important. Uh, it operates at a global or national level, not at a farm level. So it's reporting for the whole of the sheep industry, um, and it relies on farm group data um, and it combines that at the highest level. 
In terms of the shape sustainability framework, uh, following the decision uh, to develop a framework, there was what was called a, a materiality review. Uh, and I've got a slide of the outcome of that materiality review there. And it indicates how important um, to the stakeholders, both internal and external, uh, the management of our animals is being up in the top right hand corner there. Um, we also did an alignment with the United Nations uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then we undertook a period of 12 months of industry and external consultation. Uh, we finalised the framework and um, updated the materiality review and we launched the framework on the 21st of April. Uh, it's now up to uh, stakeholders to use that uh, framework uh, and it will involve uh, ongoing reporting and obviously updating as some things become more important or less important. So that's the background to it. I just want to uh, very briefly give you an idea about what's in the document and I've given you a, a, a link to it in the notes. Um, the boundary for the sustainability uh, framework is in Australia. We're not reporting on wool processing or any overseas processing at this point because we think it will be too hard to get credible information at this point from where the wool is processed. So it, it's looking at on farm and in our Australian processing uh, sector. And we have definitions um, and principles and we've aligned with uh, various of the uh, sustainability development goals. In terms of um, the aims of the framework, it's about increasing trust and transparency in the sheep industry. And it's to provide robust data on important or material issues. It will allow us to showcase sustainability, but equally it's a two-edged sword. It will highlight areas where our uh, stakeholders, our customers and consumers may think we need to improve. Importantly, the framework is not a policy or target setting um, document or it doesn't have that as objective. That's the role for the industry. The role of the frame framework is to monitor and uh, report our sustainability performance. Uh, against priorities that we've identified. And it doesn't involve any specific action from individual businesses, despite the fact that we're capturing information from what all sheep producers are doing in the framework. So as I mentioned, uh, there are four themes. We've identified 21 priorities, and against those we've put 41 performance indicators and we're reporting 60 data points or metrics against those. And in the framework that was launched, uh, of the 60 metrics that we've identified, we've reported against 33 of those at this point. And we hope to report against uh, all or the vast majority um, when the first main report from the framework comes out in the middle of, of next year. Uh, just to give you a bit of, of, of the detail on it, if we have a look at the, the sorts of things that we're doing in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the caring for our sheep theme, we've identified obviously mulesing is something that people want to know about. So we're reporting on the percentage of animals that are mules uh, and the percent of wool that's available. And we're also reporting on pain relief associated with both mulesing and interestingly uh, with marking and tail docking. Uh, and as you can see there, we've got the, the, the link to the uh, framework. Um, and there's a couple of other slides here, which I'm just going to uh, gloss over, but just giving a bit more of the detail of the sorts of things that are in the framework. And I'd encourage anyone who's interested to go and have a look at the uh, document. Um, so that's uh, showing there the, the um, environmental uh, credentials that we're looking at. Obviously, greenhouse gases, uh, but uh, enhancing biodiversity is also really important. Um, and so um, the, the main thing in terms of uh, producers, uh, it does highlight the importance of welfare and best practice uh, that we need to be doing. It will be a source of information and it will also show the industry priorities. Uh, no specific action is required, but I'd encourage you all to be aware of it. And importantly, uh, we'd still be encouraging you uh, to be having the individual sustainability initiatives that you might be doing already uh, with uh, specific uh, customers that you're dealing with. Um, and as I've said, the role is to uh, monitor, measure and report industry performance. And I think that is it. Thanks very much, Jeff. Oh, thanks for that, Bruce.
Um, Bruce, just a, a, a quick one from, from me. Uh, how are you collecting information to report on? You've got a, a number of areas that you're reporting on. Um, do you have any difficulty with that? And, and, and um, yeah, is there ways that landholders can support this? Absolutely, and that's the, the difficult uh, thing. And the, what the framework is really doing is driving getting a better data. So some of the data will be coming from surveys and producers already do a number of surveys and we capture that data. If that data isn't robust enough, even though it exists, we won't report that. Uh, we'll only report data that appears uh, sufficiently robust. And actually identifying things that occur on sheep properties uh, for the sheep industry, as opposed to just out there on the farm, even things like farm safety, no one records whether it's associated with a beef property or a sheep property. So actually identifying it against the industry is quite a challenge. Look, thanks, Bruce. That's that's uh, that's an excellent summary. Uh, we'll, we'll just have to leave you there now. So thanks, Bruce, and we'll, and we'll move on to our next speaker. So I'd, I'd just now like to um, introduce uh, Carla. Carla Cop grew up on a. Oh, sorry, we've I jumped ahead. Then we've um, actually going to hear from uh, PhD student Amy Bates. Uh, she's a student at Charles Sturt University, and uh, she hails from South Australia. And began her PhD examining the impact of view condition at joining in 2020. She was recently named Crawford Fund Scholar, and she's going to provide a, a pre-recorded recorded presentation and uh, Dr. Shaw McGrath will be online to answer any questions that come from that. So I'd just like you to welcome um, Amy. Thanks. Hi all. My name is Amy Bates and I'm a PhD candidate at Charles Sturt University. My research is focused on the impact of new nutrition, especially adjoining and reproductive outcomes. The overview of be presenting today is how I'm using modelling to refine new management at joining. The reproductive performance of sheep is impacted by season, available nutrition, region and breed. The aim of my PhD research is to determine what impact, if any, these factors may be having on enterprise gross margins. Sheep have a seasonal reproductive cycle, being more productive around the shortest day of the year. Breeding season length also varies between sheep breeds and the ability to join outside of the natural joining season is again influenced by breed and by available nutrition as well as hormone products. Improving nutrition to optimize live weight and condition score profile can improve reproductive performance. However, there are breed differences apparent. For example, borderless to cross merino ewes gained more live weight and had greater condition score when managed alongside merino ewes in accordance with the current management guidelines. Further, the birth weight of the second cross lambs was also less sensitive to ewe live weight at joining compared to merino lambs. So what this means is that improving ewe live weight at joining may not result in improved lamb birth weight, which is highly correlated with lamb survival. As sheep production varies widely across Australia, taking advantage of Peak fertility may be hindered by carrying heavily pregnant and lactating ewes, as well as growing out lambs, during periods of low pasture availability. The season sheep producers join or lamb appears to vary according to many factors, including state, region and breed of sheep. Through computer modelling, it's been observed that sales strategies and stocking rates necessary to achieve optimum gross margins vary according to the month of joining. Another study found that profit margins were improved by up to 15% when new live weight was managed to an optimum profile at lambing during spring and supplementary feeding rather than altering stocking rate was used to optimise gross margins. Joining profile also impacted gross margins in this second study, but this was to a lesser extent. And both of these studies um, were based on Merino U enterprises. The literature is in general agreement on the impact of late pregnancy nutrition on lamb birth weight and survival. However, the impact of nutrition at joining is less well understood across breeds. So my research will encompass three major components. Firstly, the collection of condition and weight data from user joining and then subsequent pregnancy scanning information. 
Secondly, a producer survey around how and why producers uh, manage their use in a certain way. And finally, I'll be putting this information into some computer modelling. So I'm working in conjunction with the New South Wales DPI. Condition score, weight and scanning outcome, being the number of fetuses um, scanned, has been collected from over 30,000 ewes across the regions you can see on the screen. So we're targeting six regions in New South Wales and one in each of Victoria and South Australia. So we collected this information across three breeds, being Merino, or less across Merino and composite breeds. And I also followed up with the producers in this study with the survey and the questions in the survey explored how and why producers manage their use the way they do. So the computer models that I'll develop are based on their outcomes from the survey and the physical U data. And this is to ensure that they're representative of each region. I'll explore three seasons of joining, being summer, autumn and spring. The three breeds I mentioned, Merino, borderless to cross Merino and composite use, and the impact of altering reproductive rate. So low, mid and high reproductive rate on the profitability of an enterprise. This information will be analysed to determine whether further refinement of the current new management guidelines at joining is necessary and will assist producers with more targeted nutritional guidelines based on the region, breed and the season of joining. So thank you all very much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, my supervisor, Sean McGrath, is in the room or my information is on the screen, so please feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much. Look, I'd just, just like to thank Amy uh, for presenting her work. It's a shame she couldn't be here to do it in person. We do. We are lucky enough to have Sean McGrath here uh, to answer any questions. Sean, I can't see you, so maybe your camera may be off. I, uh, I'm actually quite excited by this work that Amy's doing. Uh, in this region uh, of the Riverina, uh, we have lambing dates uh, right across the year. So it's really wonderful that, that Amy's sort of doing her work right across that spectrum because I'm sure we're going to get some good information out of that. So thanks for that. Uh, Sean, can you hear me at all? Maybe not. Anyway, uh, look, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, area on, and I'm sure we can get some responses to you later. This uh, session is being recorded, so you can come back at a later stage and uh, see your responses to your questions. Okay, so I, I'd just now like to um, introduce to you uh, Carla Kopp. Carla grew up on a merino stud in central west New South Wales before completing a Bachelor of Animal Science Honours at Charles Sturt, Charles Sturt Uni. And she has now submitted her PhD. So uh, welcome, Carla. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, my study um, looked at all sorts of different things related with nutrition uh, and production in sheep. Uh, so one of the projects I undertook was a producer survey looking at lamb mortality. So as, as we know, um, more than 10 million lambs die before weaning in Australia. Many of you are producers, many of you know how much those lambs are worth. Uh, so yes, it's a big, big economic impact um, on the industry. So mortality rates are around 30% for twins and 10% for singles, excuse the typo there. Um, and the main causes of mortality are dystochia, starvation and mismothering and exposure. So we conducted this survey. Now, some of you may have remembered completing this survey at the forum in 2019, where I allowed producers to participate. Um, so it was a 30 question survey um, to New South Wales sheep producers, looking at the practices and perceptions of uh, producers on factors such as lamb mortality, um, scanning and supplementation and vaccination. So uh, we can see our producers that we had um, on the map. So we had a wide variety of producers from all across New South Wales, which was able to give us a great snapshot. The major factor that we found um, and the major outcome of this survey was um, the red circle that we've got here. So we had um, 
around about 49% of producers estimating less than 10% mortality of lambs. We even had some saying 0% mortality, which is very interesting. So um, there's a lot of information about this. And then we had about 50% um, going between about 10 and more than 30% mortality. Now, this is just from birth to marking. So uh, looking at these mortality rates, thinking about um, what our estimated was. So we had 30% in twins and 10% in singles. And um, now we've got most of the people, um, uh, sorry, 50% of our producers saying 10% or less, which is um, obviously just less than our um, single lamb is. So we didn't um, pull this down to twins and singles, but what we can estimate is producers have probably got twins and singles in their data. Um, so yeah, we've got about 50% of producers more than likely underestimating their mortality rates. Um, their marking to weaning estimated mortality was um, pretty on par. Now the birth to marking mortality, it could be correct, but we are thinking uh, it's more than likely producers have not identified uh, the number of lambs that they've lost. Um, the data that we compare to is a little bit older and yes, there have been some advances, uh, but we believe that still producers are majorly underestimating the number of lambs lost. Um, another part of my research um, in this was looking at vaccination of lambs. So um, what was really good is we had 96% of producers vaccinating lambs with a custodial vaccine, which is great. Now, the only problem with this is many of you would know that a custodial vaccine, there is a initial shot and a booster similar to other vaccines. Um, and now 17% and 23% of Merino and Crossbred um, respectively only vaccinated once. Now, what that means is they vaccinated once and their lambs aren't protected at all. So that first vaccination will give you a couple weeks protection and then nil. Um, you need that booster to allow your lambs to have the protection. Now, some producers said that this was because they were selling lambs before they reached a year old. Um, it still means that they're unprotected for that time. And some of these diseases cover um, animals that would be affected and may affect um, return on meat um, and also growth. So it is important that we ensure that producers understand that we need to vaccinate uh, and we need to give the booster. So um, we're on the good start um, to making sure producers understand vaccination. Now we've just got to ensure everyone understands the booster process. So we had really good reasonings um, for vaccination, which was to increase immunity, increase survival, and because we've always vaccinated. So they're um, our major reasons of why people vaccinated. So it's good to see that people understand we're vaccinating to increase immunity. So our conclusion from this study, uh, obviously this is just a snapshot of what we found, um, but there were a few more different uh, things. But what we found majorly was that producers have lower estimated mortality rates from birth to marking um, than would be expected. And what this means is producers, if they're underestimating their lamb mortality rates, they are not really well understanding how much money they've lost because they can't accurately determine those number of lambs. Um, so in, in that case, they don't know how much money they could make based on doing practices such as supplementation uh, or scanning and putting their ewes apart, um, all sorts of different things, all sorts of different ways that we can help mitigate the, the lamb loss. So if you don't know how much, um, how many lambs are dying, then it does make it hard for you to make uh, uh, recommendations on changes that you can make on farm. Uh, the other thing was, again, that we need to be aware of the importance of booster vaccinations. And obviously we need to um, further develop our extension services on farms uh, to make producers aware of the outcomes we found in our survey. So I'd just like to thank my supervisors, MLA, the Graham Centre and Charles Sturt University for helping with this project and all the producers who helped um, to allow me to do this survey. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, excellent presentation. It's a very timely reminder when you're talking about vaccination, getting people to do that second shot. Um, it's, and it's well supported with the research, so good on you for doing that. And it's also very interesting to hear about uh, underestimating lamb losses. And uh, I think, 
you know, scanning is a very good place to start. And, and in this region, we probably don't do twin, uh, twins, mainly some people, oh, well, might only do singles and that makes it very hard to get that good estimation. So it really helps us work out where the problems lie. So thanks, Kayla. Um, there is a little bit of discussion happening in the Q&A pre from previous uh, presentations. So keep an eye on that. And if you have any other questions, please add them up there. We'll um, just continue on now as time is getting away. I'd now well, I want to reintroduce Brew, uh, Bruce. Bruce is back again. So I'll uh, hand you over. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, sorry, you've got to listen to me again, everyone. Uh, this one, uh, we're talking about the work we've been doing with the University of New South Wales group at Canberra um, with the Air Force and uh, the mustering work they've been doing with drones. So um, we've had about a bit of publicity on this on the uh, last couple of days, so you've probably seen a bit on this, but uh, basically they did uh, the a group at Canberra did some work that suggested on their work that drones might be useful for uh, mustering sheep and might even be less stressful than dogs. Uh, they came to us and asked us, would we conduct some field work with them, uh, which we've done. We've done uh, 64 runs with them, um, and I'll just go through that work. Uh, the, the main work that they're now working on is incorporating artificial intelligence um, so that the potential is that a drone would go out and do the mustering without needing to be piloted. But I must uh, uh, stress that at the moment, all the work that we've been doing them is with piloted drones. Um, so in terms of what we've done, um, we've done uh, 64 different um, runs where we've compared uh, a dog with a drone. And I must say um, that the dog was a very uh, good dog and the dog handler, Simon, uh, Hartwick uh, is an experienced uh, dog handler and um, very good with uh, mustering sheep. So it, it was uh, against a, a well-trained uh, and well-handled dog. Um, and the drone was operated by um, uh, a couple of young guys who hadn't had a lot to do with sheep, uh, but were very good with drones. And the drone was actually uh, a very cheap drone um, it uh, cost about uh, $350 off the shelf and a very zippy little uh, drone. We compared um, um, either just three-year-old weathers or we compared weathers and ewes. We had uh, two different um, degrees of difficulty just across an open paddock and we had an obstacle uh, set of hurdles in the middle that they had to negotiate. We used 16 or 48 sheep, 16 obviously being slightly more difficult than 48, and we replicated it four times and that's how we came up with the 64 runs. 16 sheep had uh, GPS, had, had mobile phones on them um, and uh, which we recorded GPS and we had heart rate monitors on them as well and we haven't analysed that information yet. So in terms of the um, uh, runs, uh, and I'm actually going to skip that slide, I'm going to go on to the summary slide. Uh, what we found was that the, the dog, as expected, a well-managed dog was more efficient um, than the drones. Uh, it completed the tasks uh, in slightly less uh, time with a higher level of control. Um, and uh, it was slightly more difficult putting animals uh, through the obstacle uh, versus the open course as expected, and the dog performed better under both circumstances. But the most important thing was that the drone was very effective at um, uh, mustering them, and this dog performance is sort of at the top of the range. So the drone still performed very well, and I was personally quite surprised how well the drone did. So though our conclusions were that they were both effective shepherding agents. Uh, the dog was more efficient uh, with more control, um, but both were effective. So what we're doing now, we've got the heart rate. We finished this on uh, Tuesday. We're uh, looking at the heart rate and the GPS data, um, and they also did a number of runs specifically with um, just with the dog uh, so they could get more data to uh, try and develop a system that would teach the drone or the drone would learn how better to muster sheep them itself. And we've obviously got to look at more complex situations. Uh, we had a paddock without trees in it. 
Uh, most of us have got paddocks with trees in it. Uh, there weren't any gullies. We didn't try it with ewe and lambs. And right at the moment, we didn't try crossing them over a creek with water. Um, so it was a fairly simple situation, but um, it certainly showed that drones going into the future, um, these high tech, very versatile, uh, very quick drones might be very useful uh, as a tool. Uh, they won't be a replacement to a good dog, but not all of us have good dogs, so they might be handy in that case. And uh, it's early days yet. So thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I, I'm sure it's going to open up a huge amount of uh, benefit, especially in hilly country in the future. So that's really good work. We, we do have a question from Michael. Michael um, is asking whether unmanned drones whether they're legal, that's the first question. And the second one, which is, um, I'll be interested to hear what your answer is, is what happens if you swear at a drone? Yes, yeah, so, so, so it doesn't really help to swear at a drone. Um, in terms of the legality of, of it, we were using piloted uh, drones. So going forward, uh, drones that were, were unmanned, that's obviously going to be something that would have to be uh, negotiated. But these these spaces are changing all the time and the rules are changing about every six to 12 months on what you can and can't do with drones. Uh, but on your own property, there's a fair bit of freedom as to what you're allowed to do. But we don't have an unmanned drone. That's I, I'm thinking this is sort of a five to 10 year project for these guys um, to be doing and we're just looking at the field work. So at the moment, uh, using a drone, can be effective, uh, but it's got to be piloted at this point uh, and certainly swearing at it. But um, uh, look, I've got to admit, the very first run we did with the drone, a crow, a crow took it out and there was another two hours fixing the, the drone back up again. So it's not all uh, plain sailing. If I've suggested that, I've led you astray. It, uh, it's fraught with danger technology, uh, but then dogs are fraught with danger too, which is probably the question about swearing. Bruce, we have one other quick question. Uh, how long was your flight time and uh, what height were the drones flying? Yes, so so typ typically the uh, the runs we were doing, the sheep had to go 250 metres. Uh, they were taking around about three minutes um, for each of these exercises um, and they did four exercises in the two hours, uh, which was the battery capacity um, in, in that that was about 20 minutes um, of mustering. The drones were flying um, at about uh, half a metre to uh, one and a half metres. Once they got too high, they weren't influencing the sheep. So they were about uh, typically one and a half to half a metre. Um, and then they'd slip up if they need to get in front of the sheep and then drop down again to basically to almost sheep level. So just Look, above the ground. Okay. Excellent, Bruce. Thanks Great for that. Questions. We've got to keep moving. So um, yep. Thanks, I'll, Jeff. Uh, I'll, I'll now move on to our our next presenter and that's uh oh excuse me i've got my timer going off uh our professor bing wang from charles Sturt university she undertakes research to understand the molecular basis of how nutrient components alter the metabolic responses important to neurodevelopment so i'd just like to now welcome uh bing wang thank you Sorry, this pre Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you so, so much, much to the Conference Organization, organization uh, providing me opportunity to introduce our study about maternal cytosine oligosaccharides intervention on health benefit of you and lamp. So cytosine oligosaccharides is one type of marine bioproducts isolated and purified from the sh uh, cracked shell or shrimp shells. They have multiple health benefit uh, study around the world. However, nobody, no report uh, uh, related cytosine oligosaccharides as a food additive in, for the sheep health and sheep production. The objective of a study is to investigate effect maternal cytosine oligosaccharide intervention on immunity status, immune status and health of you and the lambs. Study design, we have 120 pregnant you. We intervention cytosine oligosaccharide total nine weeks. The minimum cytosine oligosaccharide intake is 100 milligram per day 
per year. So the cost only per day cost only less than five cents. So we analyze, we taking the serum, we taking the blood, we measure immune markers based on our published method. So during the, uh, the we monitoring daily, daily uh, loose leak intake. So we, because we started design replicated per group, so although the group in loose leak intake variation, you can say big variation, one we combine two replicated group together. So this variation becoming the smaller. So uh, in the end, so mean daily loose leak intake refer to COS intake overall, no difference between group. Mean leaving weight of U at star during marking and during weaning, no difference between group. In the end of weaning, weaning weight at leaving weight of U, the treatment group is higher than control, but sample size is small, so no difference. Leaving weight of lamp is during marking and during weaning, the between treatment and the control group, no difference. Serum EBU marker in the U, we analyze the serum IgM, IgG, Ig, SIGA, also interleukin 10 and interleukin, uh, interleukin 2. No difference between treatment and the control, this U. However, in the lamp, we found it significantly increase expression level of serum IgM in treatment group compared to control. They have you know, two, three times higher than control in treatment group compared to control. Another marker serum IgG, IgA, SIgA, interleukin 10, interleukin 2, and the fecal sample SIgA, no difference between the control, although treatment a little bit higher than the control group. In conclusion, maternal cytosine oligosaccharides, this cytosine oligosaccharides can be incorporated in sheep feed as it did not compromising the uh, palatability of feed. They incorpor incorporated in the feed very well. Also, maternal cytosine oligosaccharides intervention is no significantly influence the body weight gain of you and the lambs but significantly increase the serum IgM in the lamps at the marking, which imply that COS has potential to improve the health of lamps. There is no significant effect on other email marker and the cytokine in the U during cytosine oligosaccharides intervention. So further study are clearly need to understand the nutritional significance of cytosine oligosaccharides in sheep production and health. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, interesting work indeed, I must say. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm firstly, uh, Oh, there you go. It's, Sorry about that. Yeah, it's pre pre recording because only four minutes, so I have to be squeezed. You know, really nervous because that, four minutes have to finish the talk. Yes, you you did a great job because it's a very complex <laughs> area. Um, yeah. I I noticed that there was no impacts on palatability and livestock performed equally well, and there was um you did notice changes in the blood serum. And I'm just wondering where you think the potential benefits might be in terms of the animal health benefits. Like, yeah. yes. Yeah, basically cytosine oligosaccharides, I mentioned that from waste, waste, you know, waste products from a, a crab shell or a shrimp shell, also al already apply very well in the Asia, Asia country, including Japan, uh, Korea and China, Taiwan, very dancing. Because of these oligosaccharides, there's a prebiotics. Okay, prebiotics is, you know, so this is can module basically is good feed or good nutrient for the gut microbiota. Okay, oh. there's a different prebiotics and probiotics. Probiotics is bacteria. Prebiotics is modulate providing biosignaling interaction because the interaction with the microbiota. Microbiota living organ, they need eating food, okay, need eat nutrient. Also, they modulate 
modulate like microbiota behavior or colonization or microbiota providing signal interaction with the you know intestinal mucosa certain enzyme because you know for for bio direction for related importantly for immunity and cognition so this is have a big potential i believe have huge potential for the health benefit using prebiotics as a functional feed develop that for through the personalized nutrition target pregnancy you also lactating you also the newborn lamp okay look thank you professor that I, i'm i'm sure we have a um we could talk about that in terms of reproduction uh, for a while. I really appreciate your time and uh, we'll now have to introduce to everybody uh, Tom Keogh. He completed a Bachelor of Animal Science with honours at Charles Sturt University, University and is now uh, undertaking his PhD. So welcome, Tom. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, where's my presentation? Hi there. All right, um, so I did an experiment last end of last year, start of this year, uh, looked at a few different things, but I'll only got a short time here. So focus on the effects of feeding level and age, age or stage of maturity on lamb growth rate and feed conversion efficiency. Uh, so quickly, the, the summary is that maximizing energy intake increases growth and feed conversion efficiency. Uh, less mature lambs are more efficient and compensatory growth occurs when sufficient nutrients become available to, to lambs that have been previously restricted. So the aim of this experiment was to identify the most efficient nutritional management of lambs. Um, and the way that we did this was we put um, uh, over 100 twin born and reared second cross lambs into a feedlot for uh, uh, about 10 weeks at four months of age. And then again, the same lambs entered the feedlot at eight months of age. Um, and there was two intake levels, a low intake and a high intake. The low intake was 2.5% of live weight in dry matter and the high was 3.5% of live weight in dry matter. Um, and we restricted this high intake group to just below ad lib intake um, just because of the effects of, of intake on digestibility. So um, in most instances, if you um, increase intake, digestibility decreases, uh, not always, but uh, we just wanted to limit those impacts. Uh, the ration was a pelleted ration, which had a really high inclusion of hay. Um, and we did this to um, not have to give the lambs separate fiber um, because that's really hard to account for uh, their intake of that due to wastage and the lambs being really picky about what parts of that they eat. Uh, but what this did was that that made that ration, uh, it was just above 11 in megajoules of ME, um, which you could probably design higher energy rations. And also with the restricted intake level of three and a half percent, probably the growth rates and feed conversions could be better with a higher energy ration and high levels of intake. So basically during the first feeding period, lambs entered the feedlot at about 31, 32 kilos. The high intake group Put on about 12 kilos, low intake group put on about five kilos, which was 215 grams a day and 83 grams a day, feed conversion of 6.4 to 1 and 11.3 to 1. And then in the second feeding period, when the lambs were eight months of age, they entered about 41 kilos. The high intake group put on about 10 kilos at 190 grams a day, and the low intake group put on just about four kilos at 81 grams a day. Um, and you can see here that the, the feed conversion is obviously much better in that high intake group and the younger lambs, the lighter lambs, um, had much better feed conversion for, for both intake levels. Um, and then additionally, so the half of the lambs that had a low intake during the first feeding period, they were swapped to high intake during the second feeding period and vice versa. Um, and you can see here that the growth of those lambs was significantly better at 205 grams a day um, and their feed conversion tended to be better. It wasn't significantly better, but um, it was a 7.8 to one. Uh, so what's all this mean? Um, so maximizing energy intake improves production. So lamb growth rate and, and feed conversion. And this should be pretty obvious to most people. The more energy available for production above maintenance, the better the animals perform. Um, so how do we do this? We 
need to maximize dry matter intake and also maximize the energy content of the ration. And to maximize dry matter intake, we need to make sure the lambs are familiar with the diet um, and the induction period is really well managed to, to limit digestive upsets. Um, obviously, from an economical point of view, the cost of maximizing the energy content of the ration needs to be considered. Um, you can pay a lot of money for really high energy rations and it doesn't pay, it, pay itself back. Um, so next, less mature lambs, they're more efficient, they have lower maintenance requirements and they deport, deposit more energy and protein than fat and, and protein deposition is more efficient. So putting a 50 kilo lamb in a feedlot and taking up to 70 kilos um, is probably going to be much more costly. Um, they need a greater amount of feed to get above maintenance um, and more energy is going to be deposited in fat, which is less efficient. And finally, compensatory growth occurs following a nutritional restriction. Um, and why this happens is because the growth actually contains more protein because that was what was previously restricted. Um, this is very difficult to rely upon as it depends on the extent of the restriction and also um, the nut nutrients you provide them. Um, and also it's important to remember the initial phase of compensation is actually just the organs increasing in mass and the digestive tract capacity increasing. And neither of those are of commercial value when your lambs head off to the abattoir. Uh, so that's all I've got. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, excellent, Tom. This is a very, very topical subject with more and more people feeding lambs. Um, I was just uh, gonna ask a question at it's a broad question. Uh, at what weight do you think animals start moving into um, where it's mainly fat that they're putting on, like in terms of people finishing lambs on farm? Um, you'll have, I'll have to get back to you with that once I've gone through and analysed all my... I put a photo up there of all the CT scans I've done and um, I've been looking at them, but I haven't really put all those results together. But um, what we did find that was actually you know, at 30 kilos, the, the freshly weaned lambs, if they've had a really good run, they're, they're really fat already. Um, so it's yeah, it's really interesting. Okay. So it's it's not necessarily just because you've got light animals that that's going to be the case. But what about at the other end with heavy animals? With heavy animals, they've put on, yeah, most of their protein already. So they're putting on very little amounts of protein. Once they, once they sort of get up to 50, 55 kilos, they're, they're putting on mostly fat. Okay, well look, thanks Tom, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure people will be interested to read your paper. So um, thanks for that. No, no okay. problem, thanks. Good on you. Okay, now I'd, I'd, uh, our last presenter, Steph Fowler. Steph's a colleague of mine and she works at Cara with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries uh, in the Centre for Red Meat and Sheep Development. Her work is focused on carcass assessment, quantification of meat quality and fatty acid composition of meat, as well as the development of technologies to measure meat and carcass qualities. So welcome, Steph. Thanks, Jeff. I hope I can get through my presentation in time. They've been pretty quick, all right, just waiting for it to load now. There we go. Um, so I'm Steph Fowler, obviously, as Jeff just introduced me. Um, and one of the main areas that I work in is really um, the shift in production system, uh, mainly in lambs at this stage, going from a value-based system to a values-based system. So we know that uh, consumers, people like us that want to buy lamb both here and overseas, they want to know more about what it is that getting, what are they buying, where has it been produced and what's it going to eat like, is it good for them or not. So a lot of the technologies and things that are being looked at um, at the moment are aimed at non-destructive rapid um, determination of those sort of qualities and they can loosely be defined as things that either determine yield or eating quality. Given that this is a really short presentation and a bit of a quick overview and update and some of the research we've been doing, I've chosen to actually just focus on eating quality today, but there is a little bit of stuff that we've been doing on yield. So if you are interested in knowing about that stuff, um, you do get in touch. So with um, eating quality, one of the main determinants of that is actually intramuscular fat. So We've been doing a study in conjunction with some genetic 
um, studies that have been going on, looking at being able to rapidly predict in industry situations the intramuscular fat content. Um, at the moment, we focused on lamb loin because obviously it's a very high value cut, but we do acknowledge that it is quite difficult to access in a whole carcass. So what we did was we measured um, a whole heap of lamb loins using our NIR device you can see there um, in the abattoir, but just off the, the plant chain. Uh, we then analysed these using a number of different methods, um, so both partial least squares, which is very typical for this area of research, but we're also trying um, some newer methods of analysis, including machine learning. And this is the sort of information that we get. So this is the NIR spectra from all of those 800 odd animals um, averaged by carcass. And what we then do is we plug that in um, with the Soxlet wet chemistry, which is the current gold standard of being able to measure um, IMF. And that then gives us um, basically a predictive ability. So out of both the PLS, um, partial least squares and machine learning analyses, what we found was that the machine learning was better. We got a more accurate model uh, with about the same error in the measurement. The downside to this is though, um, that currently with machine learning, even though we get a, a correlation and an accuracy, which suggests that it has potential to measure in abattoirs, the machine learning actually needs a calibration and test set. And with 800 odd animals using an 80-20 split between the calibration and test set, there's not actually a huge amount of numbers in the test set, um, which gives us that final accuracy um, and error. So what we're currently doing is looking at building um, this over the next few years. So we're looking at including a fair few more animals, which will then increase the number um, of animals available in that test set and give us a better um, understanding of whether or not this could be applied at an industry level and give us the same accuracy. Um, we did also, I know we threw it really quick, but we did also find um, a kill effect. So we just want to look at what the differences between kills are and what's causing that, whether we can account for that difference and then increase the accuracy um, or and decrease the error or whether that's something that's inherent um, that we won't be able to address. We're also looking at being able to predict um, the intramuscular fat of the carcass from the top side, which is more easily accessible when the carcass is hanging in the plant. So looking at getting um, a reading much earlier um, in the slaughter chain. We are also at the same time doing some research with another piece of technology called a Raman spectroscopic device. Uh, so this research we've done in conjunction with the perennial wheat team, looking at being able to predict the eating quality um, of lamb loins, which is really aimed at complementing the Meat Standards Australia sheep meat program. Um, so similar sort of method, we zap the loins um, just off the chain because obviously they're not accessible until you get to the boning room. Um, we then ran that through partial list squares analysis. And this is the sort of data that we were looking at. So this is really interesting um, because there's some peaks here. So we've been working with Raman for a number of years and each one of these peaks characterizes a, a chemical bond within the meat. And there's some that in the years that I've been working in this area, um, we've never seen before. So we have no clue what they are, no clue what biochemical characteristic um, they're actually representing. But when we did go through and do the analysis to look at the prediction of um, eating quality traits, so that was with an untrained sensory panel um, to get a tenderness, juiciness and flavour score, as well as their overall liking, we found really great results. So um, really good um, measures of accuracy with about 0 0.95, 0 0.96 um, around there but also um, relatively low error, which is really great. So errors of about one and a half to two and a half um, eating scores. And when the eating score is out of a hundred, that's really great, really promising. So the more we delved um, a bit deeper into um, the spectra and how it relates to the actual other meat quality traits that were measured, what we found is that there was a really good relationship between the spectral variation um, 
and some of the things including the lightness um, on retail display and iron. So this suggests to us that um, the, the spectra is actually picking up myoglobin. And when we look at some Raman spectral studies that have been done on myoglobin specifically, um, those peaks that we have identified as being new that we've never seen before are actually really strong peaks um, that have been associated with deoxygenated myoglobin. So this leads us to question whether or not we can actually use Raman to predict things that we haven't considered before, like shelf life and retail display, and whether or not there's um, the ability to predict micronutrients, including um, minerals. But we still, again, 48 animals isn't great to be doing product um, these sort of predictions on. So we really do need to look at building numbers a bit more. And that should help us also to further understand the characteristics that are underlying that. So yeah, interesting stuff. I think I've probably run out of time. I only had a couple more slides to go. So we still need a heap more research um, done in this area. Um, but I would just quickly like to thank the teams that are involved in this. They're pretty big sort of studies to look at. So anyway, thanks guys. Thanks, Steph. Look, uh, it's really great to see all this work going on behind the scenes that makes lamb such a great product. There's obviously a lot to it, eating quality, shelf life, being able to predict all these things. And uh, so it's, it's great work and it's really good to see the progress you've been making with this technology over the years. So good on you for that. Okay, well, I'd just like to thank all our presenters, all eight. Uh, we've now got about three or four minutes for everyone to go and have a break before our next session, session starts uh, at uh, 12.05. So just go up to your top right hand corner of your screen. There's three dots above more. If you click on that, that'll take you back to the, the home page and, and that's where you can then uh, go from there to the, the final afternoon session. So thanks again to all and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>